Here's a brilliant world building piece in Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. Morpheus, the lord of dreams, one of the endless that existed since the dawn of time, is having a chat with a friend when he overhears a discussion happening on a nearby table. This young playwright is praising the stage adaptation of Faust, and he lets slip that just like Faust himself, he'd give his mortal soul for the talent of writing such powerful pieces. That catches Morpheus's attention and curiosity. The Endless One approaches the lad and proposes a bargain. He will grant the boy the power to write stories that will greatly outlast his lifespan. And in exchange, Morpheus will commission a couple of plays. The lad agrees. His name is Will Shakespeare. Oh, what great subtext. Suddenly, it's not a fantasy that's influenced by the real world, but you'll be encouraged to believe that the real world was caused by the fantasy. Can we recreate this feeling ourselves? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the World Building Tower, a series of videos in which I first introduce you to a spec spectacular piece of world building, then from that I extract a world building exercise that any creator can try at home, if you're a writer, if you're a DM, if you're a world building enthusiast and you want to train your skills, and at the very end I present my own version of this exercise, not as the right answer, but one example out of infinite stories that could come from this set of rules. Today we're gonna explore the Sandman, but before we get to that, let me step back and talk about the fantasy genre. When you read fantasy, you are expecting the miracle, the mystery, the marvel. Things that are not common in our day-to-day -day life have a place to be common in fantasy. But truth is, like any form of art, fantasy is derived from reality. You uh, look at a campfire at night and you think to yourself, wouldn't it be incredible if I could breathe fire. And just like that, you invented pyromancy. In fantasy, you are allowed to combine real elements like fire and breathing and create novel things that just don't exist in our world. But what if we tried the other way around? What if combining fantasies we suddenly created reality? Let's talk about Sandman. Years after Will Shakespeare struck a deal with Morpheus, he is summoned to pay part of his debt. He is given a task to write a play about fairies, and so he writes A Midsummer Night's Dream, and brings his troupe to perform it in a rather unusual place out in the open countryside. To everyone's surprise, a magical gate opens and an audience of fairies themselves comes to watch the play. The characters represented in the play, Oberon, Titania, Puck, and many others, they're all there in the first row, watching. The fairies used to inhabit the same world as humans, but long ago they decided to pack and leave. They've opened this one exception for Morpheus' invitation, but as soon as the play is over, off they go. The brilliance of this world building is that it explains three things that are really hard to swallow in the real world, outside of any fantasy. First, why was William Shakespeare such a powerful writer, such a, a legend that still lives on? And if such powers is possible, why don't we see it more often, at least, I don't know, once every three generations or something? Second, where did those stories about fairies come from? And if those fairies were observed at some point, why can't we find them anywhere anymore? How is folklore crafted in the first place? Third, and in my opinion the most interesting one, why did William Shakespeare write a play about fairies? If you read about the historical context, you will find plenty of sources indicating how strange of a choice that was. And even if you compare this tale with all of Shakespeare's previous themes, 
you'll see it's clearly the outlier. Right now, it's quite standard to talk about mythology and folklore, but by the time, it was not. It could even be sort of associated with the devil and the church could have given Shakespeare some trouble. Why would a successful playwright on the rise make such an odd, kind of stupid choice? Why not stick to what was working and what he did best? Suddenly, Sandman's fantasy becomes much more believable because it kind of solves some plot holes that exist in reality. It not only connects story and reality in a very interesting way, but it sort of invites you to do the other way around and connect reality to the story. Reality makes more sense if that story happened. And this is an energy that we can learn from. So let's turn it into a world building exercise. For today's exercise, we're gonna start with a real world mystery, some historical fact that is yet unexplained or really hard to believe. And trust me, there's plenty. How did Genghis Khan, a nomad from the steppes of Mongolia, conquer most of Asia in under 30 years with just some horses and some bows and religious tolerance? I mean, who is this man? What the hell is Stonehenge? What motivated people to, to make such a thing? And most importantly, how did these people carry those gigantic slabs of bluestone for 25 kilometers with technology from 4,000 years ago. Disappeared aircrafts, historical figures who suddenly change personality from one moment to the other. Once you start looking, you'll find there are plenty of mysteries in reality that feel more like amateur mistakes in reality's writing. <laughs> so have a blast researching those, it's really fun. And choose one, two, Explain. There are two different aspects of this explanation. First, we want it to be fantastical, just like in Sandman. Was it magic? Was it the gods? Was it a secret society? Go crazy. But there must be a reason why people didn't notice that up until now. If in our lives this thing is still a mystery, it means that it's not easy to spot not verifiable, not public. What is it then? What sort of magic is hidden right below our noses? And with that, we go to the last part of the video, which is my take on this exercise. Just one example, not better, not worse than anybody else's, just one take. And if you wanna create your own world without being in informed or influenced by my ideas, you might want to pause this video now and give it a shot. There's a lot of you folks interacting and posting your own world buildings on the past, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, there was a, a huge increase in those comments and it just makes me so happy because it's such a diverse pool of ideas. Of course, your references are different from mine and different from, from each other. So the worlds I've been receiving are just so vastly different from each other, it's so, so cool. And I especially love when you folks comment on each other's world building, asking questions and, and pointing out your favorite bits. It's just a wonderful interaction. So if you're a world builder, I also encourage you to put your creation in the comments below. There's a lovely exchange happening. And let's, let's go for the last part of the video. Let's do this. <laughs> I'm gonna seize this opportunity to talk about a mystery I absolutely adore. The metalwork on the doors of the Notre Dame de Paris. Around the 12th or 13th century, nobody is sure, the local clergy was looking for a blacksmith to adorn the doors of the church. And this young lad called Biscornet offered his services very convincingly and very cheaply. Even him being very young, the church decided to give the lad a chance, and he got the job. And Biscorny worked like a madman, day and night at the forge. And the result was this, an exquisitely detailed piece of metalwork that 
blew Paris away. Nobody had ever seen anything like this. Here's the mystery. The techniques to create such fine, precise metalwork wouldn't exist for the next 300 years. We still don't know how Biscornet managed to pull it off. This is a real story. Oh, and it gets even more dramatic, for legend says that a couple of days after finishing his work, Biscornet died. The reason is also unknown, but it is said that he had horrible convulsions. Of course, of course, people created this legend at the time that he sold his soul to the devil to create such fine work, but here's where we're going to differ. You see, everything has a song, a melody that connects you to that being or element or memory. But those songs are complex, and not necessarily in the western 12-tone temperament we're so used to. If you sing one note wrong, the magic just doesn't happen. But the young blacksmith Biscorne was a terrible, terrible singer. He just couldn't get a single note right. And one day, he accidentally whistled the tune of Iron. And Iron gladly offered its services to him. Now he could shape molten iron using his bare hands without getting hurt at all. He is mesmerized by his newfound ability, but he himself is very afraid that this is some sort of power granted by the devil. So for the longest time, he tells no one and he refuses to use his new skill. Until the church decides to commission a piece of metalwork. Then Biscorne thinks, well, if I work for the church, for, for God, for the man, then my abilities can't be profane, can they? So he creates a devilishly beautiful piece. One that is as fine as he can make while still being functional as a door piece. And with each day of work, with each hour of work, he learns more about this song, more about this craft of his. The information he was missing was that as much as he was learning the song of Iron, Iron was learning the song of Biscorne. It's always a two-way street. A couple of days after he finishes his masterpiece, when he was still deciding how, if, or when he should tell the world about his new craft, Iron pulls his entrails in all sorts of directions. Iron was just playing. Iron doesn't understand death. Iron couldn't know Biscornet would cease to be minutes after this incident. If you ever go to Paris and visit the Notre Dame, Pay attention to the doors, but not too much attention. If you hear a song in your head, it might be too late. Before we finish this episode, let me make a special invitation. For the past six months, I've been part of this writer's Discord server called the Featherpens Guild. This is not my server, I am just one of the people who really, really enjoy it, and they are ready to grow. They recruited a new team of moderators and they asked me if I could invite you folks if anybody's interested in sharing your writing with thoughtful cool people on the internet then I would definitely recommend it's a wonderful server the link will be below in the comments if you want to join that's it for today folks if you like world building please consider subscribing to this channel it is growing slowly but surely and gathering this amazing community of creators posting incredible pieces of world building in the comments. It's just such a joy to read the comments and I encourage you to also post yours. As always, I am so, so grateful to my patrons. Thank you so much for trusting in me. I know this is a tiny channel and I know tiny channels generally don't get any patrons at all. It humbles me that you give that much confidence in my work. Thank you, thank you. And with that, Leave you for today, folks. See you next time. Ciao.